Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, can we save our threatened ecosystems? Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff from Hawaii News Now. In Hawaii, we're known for our aloha spirit and beautiful scenery, but our state is also known as the endangered species capital of the world. About 10,000 threatened species and nearly half the nation's rare plants call Hawaii home, but human activity and invasive species have taken their toll, and many threatened species are on the brink of extinction. Tonight on Insights, we'll discuss how we can save Hawaii's threatened ecosystems. We'd like to hear from you during our show, so call us at our new number, 462-5000, if you're on Oahu, or 800-238-4847 if you're calling from a neighbor island. You can also watch Insights streamed live at pbshawaii.org. Just click on the title of tonight's show or find us on Twitter at PBS Hawaii. Now to our guests. Sam Gahn is a senior scientist and cultural advisor with the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii. The Nature Conservancy has protected nearly 200,000 acres of natural lands in the state, including 10 conservancy preserves that provide habitats for threatened native species. Dr. Gahn was also a member of the Board of Land and Natural Resources for nine years. Colleen Cole is a coordinator of the Three Mountain Alliance Watershed Partnership based on Hawaii Island. It covers more than a million acres that contain nearly 50% of the state's remaining intact native forest habitat. Miwa Tamanaha serves as the deputy director of Kua Aina Ulu Aomo, Aomo, or Kua. Kua advocates community-based problem solving for issues that stem from environmental degradation. Specifically, Ms. Tamanaha works with rural community leaders to advance their vision for ancestral native Hawaiian lands. And Marion Chow is the Seed Conservation Lab Manager at Lion Arboretum's Hawaiian Rare Plant Program. The program rescues and recovers Hawaii's most critically endangered native plants, and the seed storage collection there represents more than 40% of the native Hawaiian flora, about half of which are threatened or endangered. Now, we've always, we've heard for many years about threatened and endangered species. Is it getting worse, uh, Doctor, or is it getting better? Well, <clears throat> I would say that the situation is, um, it continues. Uh, we have many species, as you mentioned, 10,000 endemic species and, uh, and 1,200 or so vascular plants and half of them easily are, are rare um, and a number of them, oh gosh, what's the number now of the endangered vascular plants in, in Hawaii are on the endangered species list and there are other candidates and, and we track those things over the years. There have been birds that have gone off into extinction in, certainly in my lifetime. Um, and certainly snails and various other, other species have been on the brink of extinction. Some of them have gone extinct in the wild, are, are only in captivity in labs now, and may be reintroduced in the future. So I would say uh, many of them are still on the brink, and it's an ongoing issue. Uh, Marion Chow from uh, the uh, Arboretum, you, you're in the job, job of saving these plants and preserving them, sort of like a, a I guess, sort of like a time capsule. How, how do you see it? Where, where have you seen the, the real losses in, in the recent decades? Well, um, we certainly have had a lot of species go extinct in the wild, and some of these species are now only represented by either seed collections or greenhouse plants or micropropagation plants. Um, and but we've also we've also had the fortunate um, uh, happenstance that we've been able to reintroduce some of these species back into the wild even after they've gone extinct. So I think that there's definitely concern. We've seen our share of misfortune, but we've been able to make the best out of that and save seeds, regrow these plants, and reintroduce them into the wild. Uh, Miva Tamanaha, what was it that got you into this field? Was it some sense of alarm about what was going on, and what activated you? Um, you know, I remember my, um, my father going back to Maui in the 90s and talking about um, you know, and he, he graduated Maui High in like 1960, 61. Um, like that just, there was nothing there anymore and like just a really deep sadness about that. And I think um, the privilege of the work that um, all of us um, get to do, especially with some of the elders that we work with, are there are people that have these amazing memories of abundance, um, but are standing up 
and saying, well, hey, let's do something about it. And, and Colleen Cole, you, you guys have a tremendous amount of land under your control. What's been the progress or deterioration in the native forests that you've been keeping track of? Well, I think we can show big successes. There's more acreages under protection and management now than there ever has been. There's a lot of projects and um, collaborations going on right now to protect um, ecosystem species, places, um, cultural resources, and natural resources. So I see that although we still do have a lot of species on the brink, we have so much more attraction now. Um, there's a lot of progress to be made in protecting whole landscape scale ecosystems. Is that the, the best strategy, just to protect the habitat, uh, Dr. Kong? I think you need a combination of those things. Um, each species has very specific requirements, elevation, moisture, uh, particular threats that you need to deal with consciously and specifically, but you need to have habitat for them to live in. So if you're a bird, a one acre bird preserve is not gonna do it. Um, you're going to need you know, tens of thousands of acres uh, in order to have a thriving population. And the same is true of plants and insects and, uh, and other species. Um, if we don't know all the requirements of those species, the best thing to do is to make sure that large intact habitat remains for them. You know, uh, I think that the average person living in Hawaii, you know, who's not gotten to the level of awareness of you folks might say, Gee, you know, the, what, this is, seems like an insurmountable thing to try and take on. That, you know, development is development. We've watched so many thousands of acres get covered up by houses and so on. And how do you, you know, how do you tell people that they can be part of the solution? I think that um, we've made a lot of progress so far by coming together. Um, we can't do it even just one agency any one agency here can't do it alone we have so so many different you know government non-government agencies coming together and i think that that so far has made a really big difference and i think that um the the people general you know general public folks at home can um, be a part of that by supporting any number of these agencies that work in conservation in hawaii and i think that you know it may seem insurmountable but every little bit that we do makes a difference and by putting together all the work that all of us do i think we can really make progress uh, Miwa, yeah. Tamanaha, your your organization is uh, we, we know about big conservation but most of us know about hold the land and protect it and so on but you you specifically are engaged in helping communities find solutions can you tell me a little bit more about your organization what it does um sure uh well just to speak to marion's point i think um when we're talking about ecosystems in this conversation, up to this point, we've been talking about it as if it's something very separate from where we are and where we live. And really, an ecosystem is just a relationship, right? It's a relationship that we have with our natural resources. So if you live in Hawaii and you eat in Hawaii, if you turn on the tap in Hawaii, you poop in Hawaii, <laughs> like you're a part of the natural system. And so if we're looking at the outcomes that like Dr. Gan was talking about, and they're not the outcomes that we want to have, then I think it's for us to rethink the relationship. Like, well, what are the outcomes that we want and how do we get to that relationship? Mm. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, you need to talk about KUA. <laughs> um, so, KUA really began about 13 years ago with um, Uncle Mac Poipoi, who is a Lava'a fisher from uh, the island of Molokai and cares for a place called Mo'omomi. Um, and he, was looking around and saying, you know what, there's a lot of people that are doing things like what I'm doing, and it's good work, um, but it can be very lonely. And if there's space for everybody to get together, we can learn and connect and support each other and see what can grow out of that. Okay, let me uh, move on a little bit to um, Colleen Cole with uh, the Three Mountain Alliance yes. Watershed Project. Got it. Um, why should we be worried about these species that most of us couldn't even identify out of a book? Why should people really care about this? Um, well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, I think one of the best examples I had is I had an instructor in college who said, who and probably everybody's had this um, metaphor used that 
the planet, our ecosystem is like a plane, and we're all flying in it. And you can only take out so many rivets before the whole thing falls apart. And who's to say which rivets we can live without and what we can live with? But I think that, um, like Miwa was saying, it doesn't have to be this force that's way up there to care about. It can be your backyard. It can be about what plants are in your yard, whether or not you have little fire ants in your yard or not, whether or not you get to see any native birds or not. Um, so all of these things have a place and an importance and a role in Hawaii, whether it's um, an, what we call an ecosystem service, something they provide us with clean water, clean air, or it's a cultural resource, or it's something that you just enjoy, but it's a, got a role to play here. And our job is to ensure that these roles continue as best as we can facilitate them. Dr. Gordon, how do you answer that question? Well, you know, the, the relationship um, idea is a really important one. When you go places in the world, when you travel to a different country, you don't want to see the same thing that you, that you left. You know, you want to see something different. Mm -hmm. You want to see something unique to that place. And Hawaii is the epitome of uniqueness biologically, culturally. Um, and so um, if we value that, and certainly a lot of, a lot of people do, um, then learning about the significance of the species that we have here. I think the rapid ohia death threat, the disease that's uh, hitting the island of Hawaii's ohia forest, really kind of brought that into sharp focus because ohia is an extremely culturally important tree. Um, you know, the body of Pele, the physical manifestation of the volcano goddess. And so when Merry Monarch happened, and the idea of um, hula participants actually contributing to the spread of the disease potentially, or um, the converse, that they would play an active role in spreading the word about how important ohia was uh, and continues to be and help prevent the spread of the disease from the island of Hawaii um, as, we, as we search for ways to treat it. Um, that really brought the message home that any individual species uh, certainly a species like ohia or a, or a bird species is going to be potentially important to somebody. I think the cultural importance is, is an amazing connection that people can immediately make with our native plants and animals. But let me just throw this out to all of you. Does, does this, uh, we often think about the canary in a coal mine thing, right? I, that where when, when this species dies, that we could be next. I mean, is there an actual peril to the health of our population? Um, I don't know, uh, Marion, you want to try and take that one on? Sure. I, I, I mean, I don't think that one species going extinct necessarily will lead to direct peril for human beings, but, you know, uh, a lot of times when we show, up, show someone a plant, the first question is, can I eat it? Can I use it? But I think that plants and all living things have their own intrinsic value as well. And like Colleen said, we never know what, you know, nearly extinct rare species may play some really significant role in a, a particular ecosystem. So I think it's important to really do our best to conserve them all. There's a Hawaiian saying that the coral is the, is the, um, the species that was first created and the coral is that which contributes to the building of an island. And, and so if you were going to choose the canary and the coal mine for the marine side of things, global warming, the increase in coral bleaching, um, the increase in coral diseases, the potential loss of our coral reefs that prevent storm waves from, from damaging our shores, those are the kinds of things where you, where you can see a cascade of events should that system degrade to the point where it no longer can serve as protection for us, then we're all going to be in big trouble. You know, that reminds me, that there was um, an article, I think it was in a newspaper today, that had uh, a, a visit to the, uh, the monument in the Northwest Islands, and they said they, they found huge expenses of coral that had died. But that's pri probably mostly from global warming, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like that's where you start talking about these forces beyond our control. Um, but, uh, Colleen, you know, how do you get people to feel that there's actually something that can be done? Well, I would go back to you can start with what's important to you. If um, I think um, with rapid ohia death, like Sam brought up, that was this great moment when it just affected all factors, um, all, all different people from different parts of you know, our community. Everybody has a connection to ohia. And so if that means you're not going to transport firewood, you're doing something. Um, if it means that in your yard you want to have some more native species, you can do that. You can go, there's any number of volunteer efforts you can get involved in. If your passion is the ocean, maybe you go on a beach cleanup. I think 
what I would encourage people to do is find what they're passionate about and focus on that because you can make a real difference in those areas. You don't have to start with some kind of global level topic and, and I think that's how we've had so many conservation successes here because really passionate people from the ground up have worked on something that they were very committed to and that gained a lot of momentum. You know, we've got a couple um, of questions from viewers that I'd like to get to. Sam from Manoa, interesting question. I, what kind of support do they, assuming your organizations, get from locals? Are conservation efforts homegrown or coming from the mainland? Um, anybody want to start with that one? Well, the Nature Conservancy uh, really relies on, on donations from individuals. And I would say that uh, because the Nature Conservancy is an international organization with offices in every state, um, we can hardly knock on California's door to ask for donations because California is knocking on Californians' <laughs> doors uh, to ask for, for donations. And so a lot of our, our donations do come from individuals here. And it's really important that uh, people realize that there are um, places that they can contribute to. In fact, Marion is working <laughs> on, on a project to, to further the uh, enhance ohia um, in, the, in, in the face of rapid ohia death. And that uh, that project has a great deal of local support. You know, I, I, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say about so the Ohia Love campaign to store seeds at Lion Arboretum during this rapid Ohia death crisis. Um, we started that campaign because you know we weren't able to find the funding to do that project, and we thought, let's get creative. Let's open this up to everyone that might care about this. And we got donations, like Sam said, lots of local support, very generous support, I might add, but also from around the world as well. So there are people, you know. Do you think that some of that had to do with the, the very direct connection between the fla Ohia flower and the Hula community and, and uh, that sort of thing? I think that definitely played a big role, but I think also sort of like Colleen was mentioning, people have a, a lot of different ways that they relate to Ohia and in any other aspect of our ecosystem. So everyone can sort of find their passion and their way to relate. Miwa Tamanaha, when, you, when your group, we didn't talk too much about the specifics of how you folks engage the communities that you're working with, but do you find that there's people saying, oh, you know, this environmental thing is a bunch of mainland people coming in and telling us not to do the stuff we do? I think getting back to, you know, talking about relationship, um, that, you know, there's an, um, I think an intellectual and spiritual relationship that sometimes dominates this conversation, but ultimately our relationship is also, it's kind of like a marriage, it's very practical. It's about the food we eat and the water that we drink. Um, so, for example, we work with a, a network of Levaita, of fishers from rural communities around the island that, you know, have seen declines over the last 50 years. I was talking to my friend Uncle Wali Ito this morning and he said, you know, I've been diving off Oahu for 50 years and I know, I know it's different. I know it's less. And, you know, I think it's easy for all of us in our daily lives because we're busy <laughs> to kind of think that, well, you know, the political infrastructure will take care of that problem for us. But I think, you know, for these uncles and aunties in their places, seeing these declines, they're saying, no, we gotta, we gotta do something about it. Um, and, are, and are proposing solutions to work with the state. You know, it's interesting you bring up government. I think a lot of people do sort of say, well, where's, what's the government doing about this? And this is an interesting question from a caller from Makakilo. And, and I think this is on point. Many palms are on the list. I guess the endangered list, yet the city only allows two kinds of palms on the road mediums. What's the deal with this? Let me try, uh, I'll throw that one at you, uh, oh, Colleen. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. No, it's just sort of like, you know, is the, the, the for example, we, what was the name of that tree that was planted all over the Big Island that blew down in the storm? Albizia. 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 That was an attempt by the government to fix something, but it was, had an ironic consequence, right? Mm -hmm. Is the government Actually, aware yeah. of this kind of stuff? Yeah, that wasn't, I can't blame the government for that one. That was, that's a, just a very fast growing, fast spreading tree. And there was a time in Hawaii where there was a lot of different forestry species planted and 
for our commercial industry. Um, but I would say that the state government, the different branches of federal government here, um, all of them are involved in watershed partnerships. They all come to the table and they're all very committed and it's a grassroots effort and sure some of these folks come from the mainland and some of the funding comes from you know federal pots in the mainland but a lot of it comes from here and so um, it's easy to sort of blame the government but there are a lot of very committed dedicated people who make really good choices and decisions all the time. So. Dr. Gan, you um, were on the land board and you were constantly asked to balance these sorts of issues, right? What's the toughest thing that you came across, not a specific thing, but in general in that tug of war between, say, conservation or a, a rule or a choice of something? I think, um, I think sometimes the rules would uh, find their greatest opposition when there was money involved. And so, for example, if it was fishing regulations, and sometimes you'd see the commercial fishermen coming up and, and talking about livelihood, threatening of their livelihood and the like. Um, and so uh, the economics of things always play a role. And getting back to your palm question, I mean, mm -hmm. when you, and practicalities mm -hmm. will get into, in the way. You could plant all kinds of different palms in the median strip, but which ones would blow over? Um, which ones would send large, um, nuts crashing Pause. into into windshields, and so you're limited by practicalities in in many senses. And so uh, on the land board, it was the same way. You would have the basic underlying philosophy of protecting our natural resources for sustainable use across perpetuity, um, generations to come, and that was always on the minds of the of the land board members. And then you would have all of these other factors um, weighing in: commercial factors, practicality factors, legal factors. Uh, we spent so much time with our attorneys general um, hashing up whether or not a particular course of action we wanted to take could actually be done under the, under the law. You know, I, I'm wondering how much pushback do, do folks get when, when they're involved in these things? Uh, uh, Colleen or, or anybody, what, what kind, where, where is the conflict? around this issue? Um, I would say um, the conflict sometimes that watershed partnerships face is a perceived loss of access to an area. Um, some of the work that we do involves protective fencing and um, also removing the invasive animals in there. And so that is a source of conflict and we recognize it and it's something that we try and work to resolve when we can and work with community members. I think in general there's a a real problem with access to certain areas that people used to have traditionally and so any I think perception of removing that we get conflict on we try and be so respectful and work through a process but you know like Sam said there's always going to be there's just there's a lot of different perspectives on every issue you know um, let me ask uh, Mary and Chow what what do you think is the biggest threat to the uh, to the fl to the flora you know, you know what? Because is it is it the weather changing, or is it the um, the changing of the insect population, or what? Is, do we know? Ooh, it's hard to pick one biggest threat, but I, I think that habitat shifting via climate change and invasive species those are some of the biggest ones um, that really have a large impact on our native populations. How does the how does invasive species tend to impact plants? Oh, very much so. So invasive plants will outcompete native plants. Invasive um, ungulates will, uh, but they're predators on seeds or seedlings. Ungulates are plants. like plants. So here. that's pigs, okay. deer, goats. goats. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, so yeah, so invasive animals are are a big threat to plants as Rats well as invasive and plants. slugs. Rats are one of the biggest. Yeah. So they're just sort of facing an onslaught from every direction. We just got a big pile of questions, but I haven't had a chance <laughs> to right. read any of them, so let's just go for it here. <laughs> um, an anonymous caller, can sport or subsistence hunting in Hawaii be used in a, as an effective management tool? Um, let me actually put this to, to you, um, Miwa, because you probably have to be involved when there's conflicts between people who consider subsistence hunting in particular part of their subsistence lifestyle, but it's, a, it's an issue. And fishing, too, right? Um, can it be part of effective management? I think absolutely. Um, like I said, this, you know, this group of fishers that have, they have been working for decades, you know, on these proposals with the state. They are trying to 
be a part of the solution because they understand the stakes. You know, they, um, Uncle Sal um, Kaho'ohalahala was talking about not, you know, preparing crab for his granddaughter and feeling a little conflicted because he wasn't sure if he was giving her, like, the taste, like the ono, for something she wasn't going to be able to have mm -hmm. as an adult. Mm -hmm. Like, the stakes are really high, and people understand that. Let me ask uh, Colleen on that, on that issue. I mean, um, people want to have animals that they can hunt. Sure, yeah. And we definitely, we're not about taking anybody's um, um, ability to hunt away. And in fact, we recognize that the hunting community is a community that knows the forest and the, and the plants and animals really well. And in, in different cases, we have worked with them, and sometimes it has worked to use um, hunting as a tool for management and we we've certainly have used that and sometimes it's not it really just kind of depends but they are a wealth of knowledge we have gotten a lot of support probably more support than conflict um, but there is um, it's just a huge trove of knowledge in our hunting community and we recognize that another question Rob from Ina Haina how did the native Hawaiians conserve what can we learn from them uh, Dr. oh my gosh um, so when you think about Hawaiian relationships with land, and w especially with native plants and animals, um, each of those plants and animals would be consider a, considered a kino lo, a physical manifestation of one of the uncountable gods um, in ancient Hawaii. And so you and those gods, in turn, are your ancestors. And so as soon as native plants and animals are your family, you have a completely different relationship with them. You have a reciprocal relationship in which you cannot give without taking or take without giving, certainly. And so the recognition was there that they were elders. You, as the younger, had responsibilities to take care of them. Um, and in turn, they would take care of you. So um, the native forest in the old days was not entered unless you had a real good reason to do so because it was uh, viewed as the home of those akua. You know, um, also at, at Mary Chow, the, the one of the things that I've seen that's fascinating is the idea that the ahapua'a concept of, you know, from the, from the mountains to the ocean, the flow of the water. Um, are we making progress in restoring that in any place that you're aware of? Oh, I or, think or how important so. do you think that is to the to the to the healthy environment? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm the best person to speak to that. Well, anybody can jump think, in. <laughs> I, I do think there are certainly places where large-scale ecosystem level restoration, Malkatsumakai are happening, and it's I think a direction that we're moving in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The reason I was asking you uh -huh. was because you've got all these plants sitting there in the <laughs> shelf, waiting for a place to be put. I'm assuming, and. How far do you have to roll back the environmental clock to really make a safe habitat to re replant those plants? That varies a lot by species and habitat. So there are, you know, some of the seeds that we have in our seed bank, some of the plants that are in our labs are for active restoration projects and they're happening now and we grow those plants out and they go out each year. Some of them in, in seed storage especially are there for the long term so that we can you know, wait for a time in the future when there's a protected area, managed area where those plants can be planted out and it's a good investment. They'll have, they'll have a good chance of survival. And as Colleen was pointing out, there are more and more of those protected mm -hmm. and managed places yeah. and so there's greater and greater potential. Um, coming up in the next month, there'll be a reintroduction of an endangered snail to a now protected and fenced area that has had its predators removed and so now it's a safe environment once more for those snails to go back into the wild. I, I just wanted to say something um, uh, to leap off of what Sam said about um, ahupua'a management and this idea of reciprocity, um, these values that are really embedded in that system of management and that like really taking responsibility for resources and also that kuleana rate and then also that reciprocity is is a Hawaiian value but it's also an everybody value. Mm -hmm. You know so much of this this particular discussion is about water right as well as preserving things and I, we did get a call from Dan and Aina Haina the development of Hawaii Lower Ridge has lowered the stream flow because there's no trees or greenery also, I think it's because they, they have drainage systems that capture the water and put it into the storm drain as opposed to letting it flow. Um, they want to do the same thing at Kilio'o Ridge. I think that's the undeveloped oh, ridge. Oh, oh. oh, that's okay, not even close to the spelling, but yeah, Kilio'o. And, and has anybody thought about these areas? What, why do they permit this development? 
Well, that's a tough one, right? But it's not, a, not, not an unanswerable one. Um, the idea of impervious surfaces and the way it interferes with the natural flow of water, that is recognized by many people. And so the folks that are interested in the protection of Maunalua Bay, for example, recognize full well that, uh, that decreasing the amount of impervious surface upland is, means that more water goes into the groundwater and not rushing down into the, into the sea carrying sediment and pollution with it. So, um, so there are ideas now floating around both in, the, uh, both in city council and in land use commission and in the Department of Land and Natural Resources to look at ways um, that we can work toward decreasing the amount of impervious surface and allowing the water to percolate Just down. my question though is, I think his question is okay, so that's an idea, but I mean right now does a subdivision permit require you to do that or pretty much the subdivisions being built with all the water being dropped in the storm drain? I think right now um, it's business as usual, but I do know that there are discussions underway to provide incentives and disincentives for, for people who, for example, pave over their entire property versus having a lawn that allows, that allows water to go down. I have a lawn. And I, I think this is too, like, you know, when we're talking about ecosystems and habitat as something that's out there, you know, there's so many people in Hawaii who love limu. They love it in their poke and they love the taste of the different limu. Limu needs fresh water. Mm -hmm. You have to have fresh water coming down or you're not going to have limu. And so when you're talking about, you know, how people get involved, what people can do, like, well, that storm drain system is going to be like that because nobody says anything about it, Good right? Point. Like, that's where we have to put time, energy, and dollars and votes into saying this matters. And education, I would think. I'm going to take a quick break and remind our viewers that tonight we're talking about our endangered ecosystems. We'd like to hear from you, so please call, email, or tweet your questions and comments. Call our new number at 462-5000 if you're calling from Oahu, or 800-238-4847 if you're calling from a neighbor island. Um, lots of questions. I think we've struck a nerve on a number of things. Yeah, that's good. Um, one kind of interesting question. Are there any invasive species that have been good for Hawaii? That's an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> well, there are certainly invasive Stump the species panel. That, have, that have potential uses, but whether or not they've been good overall in the ecosystems, by the def definition of invasive, yeah. the, um, it generally means that they're reproducing much faster than they, than they should, and that they are modifying the ecosystems um, in a way that's to the detriment of native ecosystems. And so um, in the long term, that's not going to be good for us. Right? In the short term, you can do biofuel with Albizia, or you can make jam with strawberry guava from Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, but those are little benefits along a, a path sliding down toward degradation. Um, the other question that I thought was interesting, the flip side of that, do we do a good job preventing invasive species from entering Hawaii? And I was just remembering and bouncing the story off of you folks where a guy who brought in a parrot had to wrap it in mosquito net for a week before he could bring it in, but at the same time he brought in a c several containers from Texas that nobody ever looked at. And I mean, have we got that kind of a uh, lot of problems and what's the root of that? Uh, yeah. Well, I, the root of it is a good question, but no, we're not really doing very much at all. We have an open door policy to everything that wants to come in here. Basically, we have a very short list of things that we think shouldn't come in here, and which means that everything else can, which means we get to be a big experiment for what little disease or critter or plant gets here, thinks it's a really great place to live, establishes itself, and then you've got thousands of acres covered in myconia. So, um, but having said that, it's long been identified biosecurity is one of the number one conservation priorities. And there is a statewide effort right now to come up with a biosecurity plan, which would be before a port of entry, at the port of entry and beyond. But I think we need to get really serious about if we don't want one more little fire ant and one more coconut rhinoceros beetle and so on and so on, we need to become a leader in the world about um, what we allow into this place that really is a paradise. You know, the other, the other aspect of that that um, I've found very interesting is efforts to eradicate existing invasive species, including things like feral cats, rats, I mean, you, 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 you open a hornet's nest sometimes when you talk about trying to get rid of the stray cats. Well, and it's that old saying, right? Um, 
when an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we, we need to spend more time preventing these things from coming in because, like you said, these once things do become established, um, it can be very difficult. It has been done. There has been some successful eradication efforts, but really it's, it's very difficult to do that. And really what you're doing is you're just managing it and you're containing it and you're holding a line that you say, well, we're not going to let any species X, B, or C, you know, A, B, or C cross this line. And that line keeps moving up and up and up. Let me ask, so, uh, Dr. Gunn, do you think that we have to be more aggressive about getting rid of species that are, I mean, let's talk about animals a little bit more. I think like, for example, I think the cattle egret, mm. there's a lot of those. They're, 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 they're kind of cool, but, you know, how big a problem is that? Should they, we put a lot of resources into getting rid of species or into preventing more from coming in. What's I think you can't you can't say one is more important than the one. other. I mean, you certainly cannot uh, uh, be eradicating um, species that are that are problematic, say disease organisms, um, and at the same time leave the door open for any other disease to come in. So you really do need to to uh, bolster the biosecurity of this of this archipelago. And the the neat thing about that is that the Department of Agriculture is the lead on the on developing the biosecurity strategy for Hawaii. And they want to do that before the world comes to Hawaii in September for the World Conservation Congress, um, where, what, 165 different countries um, and their representatives in conservation are going to be here and looking at Hawaii, at whether or not Hawaii serves as a model for, for ecosystem degradation or for positive action to protect the, the eco, uh, ecosystems and species that, that make us unique. So um, getting back to actually dealing with entrenched species, I think that uh, we have many tools uh, in the toolkit for dealing with, with those kinds of things, but um, many of them are beyond those tools. If you were saying you wanted to manually pull up weeds and you tried to apply that to strawberry guava, which covers hundreds of thousands of acres, probably millions of acres by <laughs> now, no, no, maybe a million acres, yeah. um, you would be fighting a losing battle um, with, unless you have additional technologies and techniques to add to that conservation tool chest. You know, um, speaking of uh, difficult battles, uh, there's uh, Mary of Honolulu, how did the Ohia death start? I'm going to throw this at you again. <laughs> and, and this question right now, uh, John from Hana Maui, right now we're rearranging the deck chairs on a sinking ship. What's it going to take <laughs> to save our world? Do you feel like that sometimes? Uh, you know, sometimes, but you have to keep a positive attitude. And, and you know, I think we've seen progress so far, so we can have that hope for the future as well. Um, talking about the rapid Ohia death, uh, where did it start? That's a very good question that many scientists are working now to try to answer. Um, it may be, so it's a, it's a fungus, a ceratocystis fungus that uh, the species has actually been present here already on other species, but the strain that's causing rapid Ohia death is new in the past five years. Um, how exactly that occurred is not yet understood, but there are, like I said, many, many people working on it and working to understand better how it's spreading, how it's, you know, moving around. Are you confident about how that's going to turn out? <laughs> Um, well, I think we have a lot of concern. You know, we can't, uh, we can't really say what's going to happen. It's a difficult situation. Um, you know, it may be being spread by an insect, which we also have native insects in the same family, so it may be very difficult to do something like a biocontrol. Oh. Um, so you, you, what you're saying, as I understand you, what you're saying is that <laughs> if it's being spread by an English insect, that's in the same family as an endangered insect, you can't go to wipe out the insect because you could then wipe out another endangered species trying to save Possibly. another one. Possibly. Um, so that may not be the option, but uh, I think part of the hopeful side of things is that uh, even though it is a devastating disease, it does not wipe out all of the ohia trees mm -hmm. in a stand. So we do probably mm -hmm. have some natural resistance. Ohia is highly genetically variable, just naturally. So that's part of why we're doing this project to collect seeds of ohia from everywhere that we can to get that genetic variation represented and have it available for, for future work, future restoration down the line. I'm going to ask a, a, a kind of, this question will, will kind of be a challenge. Uh, Camille from Kauai, shouldn't the tourism industry pay for some of these programs? Tourists come here for our natural beauty, and I think some people would say tourists wanting to go explore the natural world are one of the challenges, uh, Colleen. 
Well, there there has been some money um, that has been generated through industry. Um, there was at one time some funds that came through the conveyance tax that went to the Natural Air Reserve Fund and that did fund a lot of these um, conservation and natural resource management programs. That's um, no longer the case right now. Maybe Sam could go into that, but... Um, but didn't they take that money for affordable housing? I don't know what happened to that fund, but we... It's, anyway, there has been different um, methods for doing that, but I, I think that we do need to be more creative in how we fund these programs. But getting straight to the, to the question that was asked, I think that, uh, I think that tourists, when they were polled, um, said that they were willing to, to um, pay to help maintain the beauty and the environmental quality of, of Hawaii. And so I think that that, that question um, is, actually has some potential. I mean, we have, what, gosh, six or seven million people that come through Hawaii every year. And so um, that's a, that is a, 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 a great potential for funding our natural resource. Still going on the tourism thing, I've got another question here. Todd from the Big Island, world-class swimmer, swims from Kiwalo Basin to Kapiolani Park. Good for him. <laughs> Coral is dead due to abuse by swimmers, surfers, tourists. Some regulations needed. Uh, how big a problem is tourists trampling over things? Well, it's hard to say whether or not it's tourists trampling over things or the general uh, nature of having uh, the 12th largest metropolitan area in the United States next to, next to a marine resource. And so um, it's difficult to say that tourists are the only ones to blame. It's probably a long history of degradation and change of flow, change of water, change of nutrients that has occurred over the last century. Um, that's to blame. So yeah, it's, it's hard. To, it's like 3D tic-tac-toe sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the neat thing is that ecosystems are amazingly resilient and flexible things. And so that, that maintains my optimism for, for the protection of our ecosystems. If the question is, can you maintain pristine ecosystems in Hawaii, the answer is probably no. Um, some people would argue even that the most dominated, I mean most uh, native dominated ecosystems in Hawaii still are not the same as they were 500 years ago because key pollinating birds are missing, key animal, uh, insects and the like are, are missing. They don't operate the same way that they did before. And, but can we maintain native dominated ecosystems that, that continue to function ecologically? And I think the answer is yes. Okay, let me throw out a couple more. We've gotten a lot of questions, and I really appreciate our viewers for contributing to this show so much. Uh, Lewis of Waikiki, because of rampant development, are Oahu's environments beyond saving? Why or why not? Uh, Colleen, you wanna? Well, yeah, the big island I know. <laughs> I will do my best. There are two watershed partnerships on this island, and they're very active, and they're still, although I'm not as familiar, I know there's still some very amazing places mm. on Oahu and that are very diverse in their native plants and native birds, and yes, that's definitely not beyond saving. There's still many places, and I think there's still something to be said about pockets here and there, mm -hmm. um, even, and you have urban areas and you have green space. Um, for sure, there's still a lot left on Oahu as far as I'm concerned. A follow-up question from a different person, Kioki of Honolulu. What do the private landowners have to say about the watershed, especially when they have a conflict? Well, many times they don't have a conflict. Many of the private landowners are members of these watershed right. partnerships mm -hmm. that, uh, are, that cooperate with uh, state, federal, uh, county, um, agencies ignore boundaries of land ownership and work together to make sure that the, the watershed um, that they all uh, are, have a part of um, is operating. Right. Pri and, yeah, and private landowners are a really important part of the watershed partnerships and we have across the state we have 10 active watershed partnerships and it, there are 70 members total and probably half of those are private landowners. Um, and so we have two private landowners in our watershed partnership and I know in Mauna Kea there's many and they are an, an important part and a lot of times they're bringing the issues to the table. They're the ones who want um, the watershed partnerships to do something about this weed or what are we gonna do about this last chunk of forest? And so um, we actually get a lot of support um, from our private landowners. Amiva, in your experience working with communities, do you, how do you get landowners uh, to um, come along? What, what's the best argument that they would hear that would make them accepting of, maybe I'm not gonna make quite as much money off of this? I think it, it depends on the landowner, often in the relationship 
with the landowner. Um, but I think there's hundreds of examples, examples across the islands of really productive relationships that, um, that people and communities have with lar large landowners to you know, protect the things that all sides care about. It's kind of reassuring. So is it that people just realize that to be part of the community, they have to uh, give a little? I guess I'd hope so. I'm not a large landowner, so no, I guess I, I can't I, say. Well, and I would say that what Niwa was saying before, a lot of these large landowners that we work with in our watershed partnerships, this land has been in their family for many generations. They're very connected to the land. Um, and a lot of our large landowners are having a hard time still keeping the land. Um, and so they are very passionate about it. And so their relationship to it is, is what brings them to the table. Yeah. I think as an example, Kamehameha Schools, um, for example, has land in Hi'ia that they, they, there's a community group called Pai Pai O Hi'ia that's stewarding that fish pond. And they, it was really young Hawaiians that came to that pond and had a vision to restore it to a place where it's producing food for their community. Mm -hmm. And they've done that in partnership with KS. And it's also in, in KS's mission of educating Hawaiian children, like, made a place. You know, we have two. To go. The, we have two um, questions from uh, people who are asking challenging questions. Pam, Feva Beach, we have a critical need for housing. Will we have enough room for these houses if we can serve all the land we need? Anybody want to take that? Yes, one? I will. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, in uh, before Western Contact, there were uh, maybe. 400,000 to 800,000 people living in these islands with zero input from the rest of the world. And you would think that you would have a huge amount of impact on the land. But when you look at the archaeology, the traditional knowledge sources, um, the modeling of where um, taro and sweet potato, which were the two main sources of vegetable food and farming, took place, it only occupied 15% of the land. Um, and that meant that 85% of the land was in native ecosystems with full functioning watersheds and the like. Now we have maybe a million point four uh, people, uh, mostly clustered on the island of Oahu. And Oahu stands as the example of what happens when you uh, go beyond the carrying capacity of a limited island island resource. And so that person points out something very correct. You cannot just expand forever mm -hmm. and then and find yourself uh, expecting all of your ecosystem function to still be there. And so now we have the reverse. We have 85% importation of all of our needs mm -hmm. and only 15% of the native dominated uh, ecosystems left on the island of Oahu. However, on the island of Hawaii, where the largest watershed partnership still is, we still have a huge amount of, of native, native ecosystem there. And arguably, that island is still below its uh, ultimate carrying capacity of people. Um, let me ask, uh, I, I keep hitting um, Marion with the tough questions from being from the Arboretum. What does the panel think about GMO and the impact on endangered species? Good question. That's a really uh, good question. I'm willing to, to you start with that. Take it? <laughs> well, well, look, look. I mean, <laughs> she's a plant lady. Let's start with the plant lady. Yeah, go for it. Uh, well, I mean, I don't, I don't see a direct effect of GMO on native species here, but I, I do think that perhaps like the farming practices of GMO, GMO companies may um, be taking over a lot of land in Hawaii, that's one effect that I would see. You know, the, the thing they often talk about GMOs is the, the use of uh, pesticides and herbicides. Mm -hmm. um, they would argue that they don't use any more than regular farmers. Agriculture uses a lot. Um, is, is that a big issue, do you think? Is that something that's over, is it, a big, is it a big issue just for GMO or is it a big issue for all of ag, the way agriculture is practiced? I think it may be a big issue for all of agriculture, actually. Um, and definitely, I, I have heard from people doing sort of community level farming that they see these effects of um, plants that are grown with uh, herbicides and pesticides that once they're taken off of that, they're weaker. You know, they don't, they're sort of on drugs, essentially. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think that pesticides and herbicides that may be just in the environment around us could have a, that kind of effect on native species. I don't know that we've have the evidence for it yet, but certainly that's a concern. So I'm glad you wanted to pitch at a, at a recent uh, Hawaii Conservation Co Conference, we had a plenary speaker. Oh, who was it? It was, uh, was it Ehrlich? No, who was it? It was a famous biodiversity um, uh, uh, expert. And 
he actually had breakfast with, with a few of us, and we were talking about issues in Hawaii. He said, am I going to be lynched if I bring up GMO? <laughs> you know? And I said, well, it all depends how you approach it. And, and so what he finally said was that uh, GMO is far beyond just um, Roundup Ready crops. In other words, there are so many different genetically modified organisms that have benefits to, for example, salt tolerance or drought resistance or various other benefits that can greatly increase the amount of food that can be produced on a particular piece of land without changing the nature of the, the food at all. Um, and then he ended by saying, however, I have to say that I'm against uh, any GMO that leads to an abuse of, of the use of pesticides in the environment. And I think that that was a, that was a, a valid point on his part. Um, he had a chance to point out that GMO isn't a black and white issue. It's a very complex one. Um, and the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization um, had a wonderful website at one point that pointed out all of the, all of the benefits of GMO and on a, on a separate page pointed out all of the concerns of GMO. And one of the major concerns uh, at the time, um, looking at corn and native corn ancestors in Mexico and parts of North America, was that GMO could change the genetics of the ancestral species. Mm. Um, that's not a problem here in Hawaii since almost all of the crop plants, in fact, I can't think of a single crop plant that has relatives among our native, our native species. So that concern is essentially zero. Okay. There are other concerns, of course. Yeah. Um, but I think that in the future, we need a population that understands the science behind um, agriculture as well as conservation because we'll need the best that science can offer in order to deal with some of the conservation challenges we face. Okay, let me uh, move on. I got a bunch of questions that are very specific, but they're interesting because it's stuff we all kind of touch on. People on Oahu love to feed the pigeons and they just multiply out of control. <laughs> Maybe we should spread the word that they're an invasive species and will crowd out the native birds. Um, something like that? I mean, is, is that something we should be worried about? Should, should you stop feeding the pigeons if you feed the pigeons? I, well, I would say that with birds, the problem with um, non-native birds like pigeons is they can be carriers of disease. And that is one of the biggest threats and causes of the decline of our native birds, which are mm -hmm. really unique, an uh, amazing array of um, species here. And so by doing anything that's going to keep these populations growing and they're just reservoirs of disease and so I would say that that's the thing to think about when you're although to be honest if people enjoy feeding pigeons in the scheme of things it's probably not going to change much but to keep that larger idea in mind that um, you know you might enjoy all these non-native birds but they can just be carriers of disease that or can you devastating. imagine that you had native apapane and amakihi coming down to be to beg for french fries at mcdonald's <laughs> instead of pigeons and sparrows from yeah. other places in the world that would be a much more wonderful thing mm -hmm. when i was in the galapagos but then you end up with a bunch of native birds that are addicted to french fries. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully not. When I was in the Galapagos, you could go into the supermarket and in the rice aisle, you know, where they had the bags of rice, you would find three different species of Galapagos finches eating rice off of the floor that had broken out of the bags. And I thought to myself, oh, that would be amazing if our native birds were in our urban areas. And the main thing that's keeping them down is avian disease, is bird disease spread by mosquitoes. Mm. And mosquitoes are not native to Hawaii. And so one of these days, if we could get rid of mosquitoes from the Hawaiian environment, we could see our native birds coming back down into sea level again. Okay, another, another interesting um, question about a particular species. Uh, Claire from the Big Island. I've lived in the Big Island for 33 years in North Kohala. The native brown gecko has almost completely disappeared, being aggressively pushed out by the green Madagascar gecko that started showing up about 10, 15 years ago. Any comments on this? Anybody? Wow. Well, I'm not exactly sure about the Madagascar gecko. Was that a released pet from the pet trade? Oh, probably one yeah, of those things. Yeah, that's, that's actually a big issue that we see. I mean, now there's Jackson's chameleon the all trade. over yeah. the place on our streets. There's a lot of people who think they're just going to release a pet. and. Uh, you know what can happen, and in fact, they they become established and they outcompete um, our native species, and yeah, that is sad. But that's a real consequence of doing that, and that's also why we need to be stricter about what pets we allow to be imported into Hawaii. Um, uh, another interesting species, I believe, California grass or Guinea grass is taking over wildlife areas in Hawaii. 
How can we combat this? This is from Robert Snyder. Oh my gosh. Mm. Well, grasses are very uh, successful plants. And so it's very difficult to control grasses once they get loose. And so things like fountain grass on the island of Hawaii, buffalo grass at low elevations, the same place as Kiawe grows. Kiawe has another aggressive uh, lowland plant. Um, all of those plants are, um, are highly problematic. As a botanist, do you think that there's ways to, to deal with that? Uh, you know, I can't imagine how you would get rid of something that is completely... Yeah, the, the grass is especially a big one, like any grass that's tough, but I think that the best thing to do is if you are going to eradicate it in an area because it will take a lot of effort, um, you have to be ready to be replanting with native species. Uh, because if you take something out and you leave it like it is, then invasive species are just going to come back in. So it's got to be part of a whole plan. Time for one more question, and oh th gosh. there's two on top of each other um, that I think are interesting. One person brings up the experience of New Zealand, where I think they wiped out was it the rabbits, the, the, uh, rats? There was a huge program over there, um, and they were successful. Another question asks: Is there any place that has been successful in, in dealing with things to the to the level we have? Um, certainly, okay. certainly, New Zealand is a, is a model for for that kind of approach. Um, they've been able to remove all predators from large acres of land, and and the rebound of both vegetation and the native uh, species, including flightless birds and and other things, has been remarkable. And we have a small scale example of that at in a point on this island with a predator-proof fence, and that has allowed the shearwaters and the albatrosses there to to rebound amazingly. But also the coastal plants. Um, that just 20 years ago were being donutted by off-road vehicles and, and the like, and all their seeds eaten by rats and mice uh, are now um, coming back in remarkable ways. So there's, there's a great deal of potential in that direction. Actually, we've run out of time. I want to thank you all very much for a very interesting panel, and thank you, viewers. We've got lots of calls and really appreciate it. Next week, we're going to be talking about service animals who provide essential support for those with disabilities, but what about comfort animals that provide emotional support? Is there a place for them alongside animals that help those with disabilities? We'll discuss on the next Insights on PBS Hawaii. That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff from Hawaii News Now. Ahui ho.